So I've always wanted to be a, a man who needs no introduction, and I've been told I'm not getting one, so I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm Peter Klein. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you this afternoon about entrepreneurship. Uh, I especially appreciate giving this talk on Monday of Mises U, right, the first full day of the conference, because that's a good way, I think, to demonstrate that for Austrian economists, entrepreneurship is a very central topic, right? This is not just an application of economic theory that we'll cover later in the week when we get to the fun stuff. Right? Entrepreneurship is something that is really very central to the Austrian analysis of markets and prices and economic activity. Uh, to see this, if you look at uh, human action, uh, this is the index from human action, you notice that the word entrepreneur and, and versions of the word entrepreneur uh, actually have quite a few page references in the index. Uh, you know, by contrast, look at, uh, look at equilibrium which only gets a very small amount of space. Um, uh, this isn't a full count. I, I actually did a, 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 I counted using the electronic edition of human action how many times the word entrepreneur or one of its derivatives appears, and I counted 527 occurrences. Now, there's probably some electronic tool that would have just told me that, but I actually went and counted. I clicked next, <laughs> next, next, next. So I might be a little off, but, uh, but uh, Mises talks a lot about entrepreneurs, uh, and not just in the context of you know, technology innovation, but as you can see, uh, in the context of production and, and pricing and economic growth and so on. So what did Mises mean by entrepreneurship? Who was an entrepreneur in Mises' analysis? Well, I think he's not only talking about small business owners, sorry, Carmen, um, he's not, not, not only talking about, you know, people who go on to start famous technology companies. Uh, he's not talking only about street vendors in developing countries, uh, nor is he talking about individuals who are particularly skilled at getting taxpayer subsidies. Um, <laughs> He really has something much more basic in mind. Listen to this passage from Human Action that I've always found very illuminating. Mises writes, it is impossible to eliminate the entrepreneur from the picture of a market economy. The various complementary factors of production cannot come together spontaneously. They need to be combined by the purposive efforts of men aiming at certain ends and motivated by their urge to improve their state of satisfaction. In eliminating the entrepreneur, one eliminates the driving force of the whole market system. So the entrepreneur is the driving force of the whole market system. Right, notice the language here. Mises talks about uh, factors of production, which we've already discussed uh, today, uh, the idea of uh, uh, human actors employing scarce means to achieve their desired ends. And in a modern industrialized economy with a complex structure of production, as Dr. Garrison was discussing, uh, these things don't happen automatically. Production doesn't happen on its own uh, by magic. It happens as the result of the actions of particular individuals. And these entrepreneurs are the agents who drive the market forward, according to Mises. So again, notice that entrepreneurship is portrayed by Mises as a very general feature of the market economy, right? Entrepreneurship is not only about startups or self-employment or tech companies, though, of course, entrepreneurship has a lot to say about those particular phenomena. But in fact, Entrepreneurship is really central to the Austrian understanding of the market. Now, Roger Garrison gave a, a detailed and informative lecture about capital theory. And so just to generalize a little bit from that discussion, uh, think about the Austrian understanding of production, right? Where do goods and services come from? The things that are available to us uh, to, to, you know, to purchase uh, at the store today. Uh, well, production, of course, involves the transformation of inputs into outputs, right? The use of means to achieve particular ends. And so we might distinguish between 
what Mises calls the original factors of production, like land and labor, and the intermediate or produced factors of production, machines, tools, capital goods, uh, assemblies, uh, intermediate products, and so forth. And you know, one of the things that uh, is emphasized almost uniquely by the Austrian school is that production is hard, right? There are lots and lots of ways that we can combine inputs into the production of particular outputs. There's lots and lots of ways to make goods and services that consumers might desire. And somebody's got to figure out, among all the possible complex combinations of inputs, right, across time and space, over time and so forth, how do we choose what combinations to put into practice? Uh, and, and like, as I say, Roger has already emphasized the sort of essential uh, uh, insights from Austrian capital theory, for example, that production takes time, right, that there is uncertainty involved in production. And uh, Roger sort of hinted at uh, the Austrian concept of imputation, and I'll elaborate on that in, in just a moment with the notions of marginal product and, and marginal revenue product. But again, key to an Austrian analysis is the idea that the future is uncertain, right? So when we begin the production of goods and services, we don't know exactly what market conditions will be like uh, once we're finished, okay? So imputation is a very famous uh, idea in economics associated with the Austrian school. One of the great contributions of the Austrian tradition, as recognized even by those outside that tradition, is the idea that the value of goods and services used in production, the value of the means that are used to produce goods and services, are determined by the value of the ends that consumers, the value that consumers place on those ends, right? The value of the means is determined by the value of the ends rather than the other way around, as I think Joe Salerno was talking about or someone was talking about uh, the labor theory of value, right, which gets the causation exactly backward, right? So uh, what's, what's marginal revenue product? Marginal revenue product is the amount of additional output that is produced by using one additional unit of input, right? So the marginal revenue product of an input is this marginal product express, expressed in monetary terms, right? So the discounted marginal revenue product is the money revenue attributed or imputed to one service unit of a factor discounted by the social rate of time preference, i.e. The, the pure rate of interest. Right, so what's the value in production of one more unit of labor? Well, it's the amount of additional output you get from employing that labor on the margin, that's the marginal physical product, times the dollar value of that output on the market. That gives you the marginal revenue product. And because production takes time, when assessing you know, your willingness to pay for those inputs at the start of production, you have to apply some kind of discount rate because the revenues will not be received until after production is completed, right? So the discounted marginal revenue product of, a, of an input, of one unit of an input, right, establishes the entrepreneur's maximum willingness to pay for that input, okay? So if I'm thinking of employing an additional hour's worth of labor of a particular type in production, I'm thinking, what does it cost me to employ that additional unit of labor? That's the wage that I'm paying my employee per hour, for example. I compare that to the discounted, present discounted value of the additional revenues I expect to receive from using that additional unit of labor, right? And I wouldn't pay more for the input than I expect to receive, notice the word expect is important here, than I expect to receive uh, in additional revenue uh, discounted appropriately. So if you can imagine multiple entrepreneurs bidding against each other for the use of inputs in production, we would imagine that you know, if there were no uncertainty about the future, if everyone knew exactly how many units of output that additional unit of input would produce, and if everybody knew exactly how much consumers would be willing to pay for that additional output, 
then, then we would imagine that competitive bidding among entrepreneurs would bid the price of that input up to its discounted marginal revenue product. Yeah, there's certain exceptions to that, which we can talk about uh, during the, you know, in office hours if you want, some technical exceptions. So what does this have to do with entrepreneurship? Well, what is the source of entrepreneurial profit and entrepreneurial loss? Well, again, imagine a situation in which there is no uncertainty about the future, right? Everybody knows what will happen tomorrow. I'm producing some good or service. Uh, I employ a certain amount of inputs, certain quantities of different inputs to produce that output. And I know and everybody knows how much output that will give me tomorrow and what consumers will be willing to pay for that output on the market. So imagine a kind of an equilibrium construction like the evenly rotating economy, or ERE, of Mises and Rothbard. The ERE is meant to describe a world in which everybody sort of repeats the same behavior day after day. So, I mean, it's not static. There's like motion, but it's not really human action in Mises' sense. It's just people repeating the same. It's like Groundhog Day or uh, what, was, what was the Tom Cruise movie? Uh, yeah, Edge of Tomorrow. It's like Edge of Tomorrow, where you just wake up and relive the same day. You know exactly what's going to happen. There's no uncertainty, okay? So in a world like that, right, each factor of production would earn exactly its discounted marginal revenue product. Owners of firms, or owner managers, if you like, they'll receive some payment for the value of their services in management, right? So those of you who've studied uh, economics, right? This, think of this as sort of an opportunity cost, right? If I'm, if I'm uh, the owner manager of a firm, uh, I wouldn't do so unless I get at least as much excess revenue as I would earn if I just went to work for somebody else, okay? So to, to be a kind of equilibrium, I have to get paid my, my opportunity wage. Uh, capitalists, those who own resources and lend those out in advance of production will earn an interest return. But nobody earns any profit, nor does anybody earn any losses, right? Because all the revenues that come in are paid out to, fa to, to factors of production in implicit wages or in interest, right? So businesses still exist, and revenues come in and expenditures go out, but there's nothing left over once all the factors have been paid. There's no money left in the pot to be a residual profit, nor do revenues ever fall short of expectations because everybody knows exactly what's going to happen each day. Of course, that's not our world, right? That's not the world that we live in. So outside the evenly rotating economy, in other words, in the real world, uh, entrepreneurs are competing for factors based on their knowledge and their beliefs about the present, right? The state of technology, productive capabilities, the availability of resources, and so on, right? So entrepreneurs have different beliefs about what you can actually produce if you use another unit of labor or of a particular type of ca uh, capital good or raw material, right? But also, and, and more important, entrepreneurs have different beliefs about the future, Right? What will consumers be willing to pay for my stuff once I make it? Will they want my stuff at all? Right? What will my competitors have done in the interim? What will be going on with you know, tax policy or the business cycle or any number of things that could affect my revenues? Right? Entrepreneurs have different beliefs or expectations about all of these conditions. Right? So the result is profits and losses. Okay, so companies like Apple and Samsung, for example, which dominate the mobile phone industry, when they came out, when Apple came out with the, the, for the original iPhone and its successors, and when Samsung became the most effective sort of imitator of the iPhone design, and now actually Samsung is leading in many areas of innovation over Apple, right? These firms correctly anticipated that consumers would be willing to pay higher prices than they had ever paid before, for a mobile device because of all these additional capabilities that that device would have, right? Whereas at the time that the iPhone and iPhone clones began coming out, the two dominant companies in the mobile phone industry were BlackBerry and Nokia, 
right? Both of which are for all practical purposes gone from the market today, right? There's a, the, the, one of the co-CEOs of Research in Motion, which was the parent company of BlackBerry, famously said on seeing, you know, an iPhone for the first time, something like, well, the only app anybody would ever need is a web browser. And our device has a web browser. So what's this whole app thing? What's an app? Who, who, who cares about apps? Right? Look, I mean, of course, it's easy in hindsight to say, oh, you idiot. <laughs> right? But I mean, at the time that this sort of new type of device was being introduced by Apple, it, it was far from obvious that it would be a success, right? Apple had never been in the mobile telephony business. It was not clear whether consumers would be willing to pay for all those extra features. And of course, you've probably seen these jokes about a Nokia phone. You, know, you can drop it out of a 20-story building and pick it up off the ground and it works, you know? <laughs> Nobody was sure that consumers would be okay with a very expensive and fragile device in their pocket. What if you sit on it and it smashes or whatever? Um, so in hindsight, it turned out that that you know, uh, Steve Jobs and his associates, they were correct in their anticipations of future market conditions, most importantly, consumer preference. Uh, and the, the decision makers at BlackBerry and, and Nokia and so forth were not correct, right? So you earn profits when your anticipations are accurate relative to the fu actual future state of affairs. You earn losses uh, when the reverse is true, right? So remember, to earn a profit, entrepreneurs are trying to underpay for factors. What I mean is to acquire factors on the market at prices below what those factors will ultimately be revealed to be worth. And you earn losses when you overpay in the sense that you pay more for factors than what the discounted marginal revenue product will eventually be revealed to be. Okay, so the point is in the absence of uncertainty, you don't have profit and loss. Profit and loss only exist under conditions of economic uncertainty. So what then is entrepreneurship? Well, according to Mises, the term entrepreneur, as used by economic theory, means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. So we are acting as entrepreneurs when we're acting in the face of uncertainty. And by the way, Right, Mises doesn't mean probabilistic risk. He means uncertainty. Some of you might be familiar with Frank Knight's famous distinction between risk or uncertainty, risk and uncertainty, or the version uh, put forth by Mises' younger brother, Richard von Mises, distinguishing case probability from class probability. But we're talking about true uncertainty here, right? So the term entrepreneur is used by economic theory when referring to acting man in the face of uncertainty. Now, you might say, well, then isn't all human action entrepreneurial? And the answer would be, yes, it is, right? All of us are acting as entrepreneurs when we get out of bed and go out, you know, across the street every morning because we don't know with certainty whether the, you know, whether the means we employ will achieve the ends that we desire. But, of course, that might be a little bit too broad. That's why I call that entrepreneurship in the broad sense right, following Mises' definition. But we might want to think about kind of a narrower sense of entrepreneurship, sort of commercial, professional entrepreneurship, the type that we might find more interesting and important for explaining the workings of the market economy, right? So this, you know, what I consider to be entrepreneurship in the narrower sense is, you know, the act of purposefully and deliberately combining and recombining productive factors in the pursuit of money profit, okay? As uh, Ludwig Lachmann, an uh, uh, important Austrian economist, once put it, we're living in a world of unexpected change, i.e. uncertainty. Hence, capital combinations will be ever-changing, will be dissolved and reformed. In this activity, we find the real function of the entrepreneur. In other words, the real function of the entrepreneur is the constant combining and recombining of heterogeneous capital resources in the pursuit of money profit and in an attempt to avoid money loss. Okay? So, uh, again, you know, you might say, I, you know, 
I'm an entrepreneur when, you know, I get out of bed in the morning and I go across the street to buy a gallon of milk and I make it back to my home, you know, unscathed. It's like, oh, I've, I've achieved ends that are greater than the value of the means, so it's like I've earned a profit. I mean, yeah, it's got like a mental profit or a psychological profit. You can, you can think of it that way. You know, it, 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 you know, if I fall into a ditch on the way back and break my leg, you say, well, I earned a loss. <laughs> I mean, that would be technically true, but probably not very interesting, right? If you want to explain why the you know, U.S. economy is growing and some other economy isn't, my, my decision to you know, go to the store is probably not really a, a big mover there, okay? But it's the decisions of you know, people like Steve Jobs and the, the former co-CEOs of, of Research in Motion and so forth. Their attempts to, uh, to earn monetary profit and to avoid monetary loss have a much greater impact on, the, uh, uh, on real economic conditions. Hence, we might be justified in restricting our attention to them rather than me you know, trying to get a gallon of milk. So, because we're talking about money profit and money loss, there's a critical role here played by economic calculation. And uh, Salerno will have a talk tomorrow on economic calculation, which will not be as good as this, but we'll give you a little <laughs> bit of information, maybe useful. So, uh, one, one way to think about entrepreneurship under uncertainty is with the concept of judgment. Judgment is a word uh, that um, w was, was importantly used in the entrepreneurship literature by Frank Knight, who was not an Austrian economist, but a very important theorist of entrepreneurship. And the same word is used by Mises to describe how the entrepreneur tries to conceive of the uncertain future. So, one way to think about judgment is decision-making under uncertainty, right? Trying to conceptualize what the future will be like without a formal model or a decision rule. If any of you have studied formal decision theory, right? You can imagine an actor, you know, with some choice and there's five possible outcomes and we know the probabilities of each outcome and so forth. That's not, making a decision under those circumstances is not judgment because you just, you just use math, right, to, to, to tell you the optimal course of action. We're not talking about that. We're talking about situations of much greater complexity and ambiguity where the set of possible outcomes is unknown and maybe cannot even be enumerated or listed, much less can we assign mathematical probabilities to different outcomes, right? You know, you might call this intuition or <laughs> gut instinct, right? Sometimes you just know something or you're very confident in your belief about what's going to happen tomorrow or how something's going to play out. You can't exactly articulate how you know it in words or in numbers, but you, you feel very strongly about it. You have a kind of gut instinct. You know, the Germans, as, as they often do, have a great word for this, verstehen, right? Which is usually rendered in English as understanding, but that, that, that translation doesn't really do it justice. It's, it's very sort of a deep understanding, a, a very fundamental understanding of something about the world. Listen to how Mises describes the entrepreneur in a market economy. Mises says, again, this is in human action. He says, the real entrepreneur is a speculator, a man eager to utilize his opinion about the future structure of the market for business operations promising profits, money profits. This specific anticipative understanding of the conditions of the uncertain future defies any rules and systematization. Okay, you can't write it down in a formula, right? It can be neither taught nor learned. The entrepreneur sees the past and present as other people do, but he judges the future in a different way, okay? So according to Mises, decisions by entrepreneurs about what resources to acquire, how to combine factors of production in different ways in an attempt to produce different kinds of goods and services, how to react to competitors, how to anticipate policy change and so forth, is part of a specific anticipative understanding, a kind of tacit, intuitive, and idiosyncratic set of beliefs, right, that is sort of beyond the scope of formal analysis. That's what it means to judge the future. Uh, I, I wrote a book in 2012, or co-authored a book with Nikolai Foss called Organizing Entrepreneurial Judgment that elaborates on this, excuse me, Misesian 
notion of judgment, what it means to judge the future, and what that implies for how businesses are organized. I think you can get the book downstairs in paperback at a very reasonable price. Um, <clears throat> Central to uh, our treatment here is the notion that to, to, to engage in entrepreneurial judgment in, in the sense that we're describing requires the entrepreneur to take ownership of critical resources, right? So the entrepreneur is not just sort of a free-floating agent who's sort of outside the production process, doesn't have to bear any risks, right? Doesn't have to, doesn't have the risk of losing his capital. No, the entrepreneur is a player, right? The entrepreneur is an investor and the entrepreneur is an owner, right? What Mises sometimes refers to as the capitalist entrepreneur. As we'll see in just a moment, the entrepreneur is also a capitalist and under conditions of uncertainty, the capitalist is also an entrepreneur. By the way, I have a, another book called The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, which you can also get downstairs at a even more reasonable price. And you can get it online for free because it's open source, um, open access. So, you know, you often hear Austrians talking about the market process, the entrepreneurial market process. What is the entrepreneurial market process? This is the process of competition among entrepreneurs to acquire profit and to avoid loss, right? In Mises' little book, uh, Profit and Loss, which I highly recommend, uh, he, he's in a, in a section talking about consumer sovereignty, he, he puts it this way. If entrepreneurs fail to produce in the cheapest and best possible way those commodities which the consumers are asking for most urgently, they suffer losses and are finally eliminated from their entrepreneurial position. Other men who know better how to serve the consumers replace them and so forth. He's talking about sort of the, uh, uh, you know, the role of the consumer in determining what gets produced and uh, how things are produced, and so forth. But this notion that, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're not using the resources under your control, the resources you own and command, in a way that is effective at satisfying the desires of participants in the market, you will lose your capital, right? You, you'll fail. You'll earn losses. You'll go bankrupt. You'll exit. You'll be replaced by somebody who can do it even better. That is the process by which entrepreneurs drive the market forward. Okay, so Mises points out that, of course, this is not true for government agencies, right, which are not subject, not subject to that kind of uh, market dis consumer discipline. Even nonprofit organizations are a little bit different. And you might, if you've seen this passage before, you might recall that Mises compares this sort of democracy of the market, quote unquote, with political democracy, and says, this is way better, okay? Because unlike elections, which are typically winner take all, right? Everybody can win in the marketplace, right? We don't all consume the same type of breakfast cereal or wear the same brand of shirt or whatever. Your, your idiosyncratic tastes can also be accommodated in the market. Uh, uh, unlike is the case with, with winner-take-all elections. And I just want to note, as, as a footnote, this is not the same thing as the convergence toward equilibrium, which is the way the term market process has also been used in the Austrian literature. I don't think that's what Mises means by the market process. It's not the process of equilibration in a particular market. It's the process by which entrepreneurs compete against each other over time, some being more successful and earning profits, others being less successful and earning losses and eventually having to exit. Uh, Mises also uses, uh, well, Mises points out in, in human action that this very abstract and formal notion of entrepreneurship that we've been discussing can be a little confusing because in ordinary English, not only in popular literature, but also in some of the academic literature, uh, people have used the word entrepreneur a little bit differently. All right? So Mises recognizes that economics also calls entrepreneurs those who are especially eager to profit from adjusting production to expected changes in conditions. Those who have more initiative, more venturesomeness, and a quicker eye than the crowd, the pushing and promoting pioneers of economic improvement. 
In other words, not just every individual who performs this abstract function of combining and recombining productive resources in an attempt to earn profit and avoid losses, but people who are really good at it, people who do it a lot, people who are particularly successful, people who are very innovative, you know, maybe charismatic. You know, we think of Steve Jobs or, or Richard Branson or, or even Elon Musk, right? I mean, people who just seem to have this energy about them and they're particularly aggressive, they're very uh, uh, alert to, to changing conditions and so forth. Mises essentially says, gee, it's too bad that we use the same word to describe those people as, as we use to describe the very general abstract function of arranging resources under uncertainty. Wouldn't it be nice if we had another word? And Mises suggests the word promoter to describe these particularly charismatic and energetic and successful people. Um, unfortunately, that word didn't really take off, okay? <laughs> If you read the entrepreneurship literature today, people are still using the word in both senses, which leads to a lot of confusion, I think. Um, but what we, Mises has in mind by a promoter is somebody who you know, invests a lot, is a big player, right? Someone who's particularly alert, very creative, has leadership skills and so forth. But notice this is not really a praxeological construct. The promoter is a, is a more loosely defined, kind of historically contingent concept, you know, than the pure functional entrepreneur of economic theory. I may not be able to describe exactly what a promoter is, but I know one when I see one, or I can tell you looking in history and looking outside the window who meets that uh, re requirement. But part of the reason I bring this up is because I think even within the Austrian tradition, there's some confusion between the pure functional entrepreneur and the notion of a promoter. For example, uh, in the Austrian literature, the most famous articulation of the entrepreneurial function is not Mises' notion of uncertainty bearing and judgment, but rather Israel Kirsner's notion of entrepreneurship as discovery. So Hayek wrote in a famous article called Competition as a Discovery Procedure that competition in the market right, is, is important primarily as a discovery procedure whereby entrepreneurs constantly search for unexploited opportunities that can also be taken advantage of by others. Right, so uh, Hayek, is, is, he's sort of riffing off, off his famous 1945 article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, and saying that in the real world, knowledge, you know, tacit knowledge is dispersed, and not, not everybody has all of the knowledge that would be necessary. You're probably familiar with that uh, as Hayek's critique of central planning. Right? So Hayek says, well, under competition, you have entrepreneurs who are competing against each other to discover the relevant knowledge that can be used in production. And Kirchner, sort of building upon this notion, uh, describes, famously describes uh, entrepreneurship as alertness to changing and buying, selling, sorry, alertness to changing, buying, and selling possibilities, alertness to relevant new information, alertness to potentially worthwhile goals hitherto unnoticed, as well as toward unnoticed, potentially valuable alternative resources. The entrepreneur notices a price discrepancy before others do. So the entrepreneur in Cursor's model is an agent who is particularly alert to changing market conditions, right? Who recognizes an opportunity to earn profit before other people do. Um, I mean, I, I certainly think there's an important element. I think Kirzner is hitting at something that is important in an actual market economy, though I think this notion of the alert entrepreneur is much closer to Mises' notion of the promoter than Mises' notion of the entrepreneur, strictly speaking, in economic theory. In fact, I, I, I personally, uh, getting on my soapbox a little bit here, I, I, I have some, um, uh, some concerns with the discovery concept or the discovery metaphor as it's used in entrepreneurship, in the entrepreneurship literature. I mean, one problem is that I don't think it's right to think of entrepreneurs discovering things in the market Rather, entrepreneurs are creating new things, okay? So, so people have said, well, if you look at a modern smartphone, an iPhone or whatever, uh, you know, if, you know, 
was the iPhone just sort of out there waiting to be discovered if Steve Jobs hadn't done it, somebody else would? Have you ever played that time machine game? You know, if I had a time machine, what would I do? You might want to go back and meet Julius Caesar. But no, I would want to go back and make a lot of money, right? And so one way to do that is, you know, transport myself back to like 2004 or 2005, right before the iPhone has been introduced, and do the R&D and, and go out and buy the materials and start selling iPhone-ish things before Apple ever goes into the market, right? You know, then I would be the bazillionaire instead of Steve Jobs and people holding Apple stock and so forth, right? And we often think that way because we think, you know, gosh, if, if Apple hadn't come up with this innovation, somebody else would have. It was just out there. All the money you can earn from selling iOS devices was sort of sitting out there waiting for somebody to stumble upon it. Okay, I get it. I mean, I, I get the idea, but I think that is, in some sense, a misleading way to think about what entrepreneurs do. Because as I indicated a few slides back, you know, yeah, in hindsight, gosh, why didn't I think of that? But at the time, it was far from clear that making that kind of device was a good idea, right? So it wasn't that Steve Jobs discovered profits that were out there or that he discovered a device that anybody could have made. No, he took sort of the bold initiative to introduce something new to the market, which might have succeeded, which did succeed, but at the time could have been successful, could have been a colossal failure. But of course, Steve Jobs had many colossal failures, like the next computer system, uh, the Newton, some of you old timers might know about, or you could Google it. Um, so that's, that's one problem. I think this notion leaves out, it, it de-emphasizes the creative aspect of entrepreneurship. And of course, opportunity is a metaphor, right? Opportunities don't literally exist. That's a, that's a metaphorical term that we use ex post to describe successful action, right? Oh, I'm glad I had the, glad I have the opportunity, uh, you know, to make that money. Literally, opportunities, the word opportunity literally re refers to objective physical conditions, right? I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. I mean, because, I mean, I literally have it. There's like a podium here and a microphone and you're like sitting out there and they've locked the doors and all that, right? <laughs> uh, it's not quite the same thing as to say, I discovered a profit opportunity that could be earned from selling iPhones. Right? That's, that's, that's just a cognitive sort of tool that we use. Um, more practical problem is if we understand entrepreneurial profit as the result of successful discovery, it becomes a lot more difficult to explain entrepreneurial loss. Okay, so if all the profits from selling iOS devices is understood by the fact that Apple was quicker than other people to discover that those profits that could be earned, what did Research in Motion and Nokia do? Did they discover losses? Well, that doesn't make sense. Did they discover failure? No. Uh, I mean, the way Kirchner describes it is he said, well, you know, some people fail to discover opportunities that other people see, which is fine. But if you fail to discover something, then you break even, <laughs> right? You never invested, you never tried, so you didn't win anything, but you didn't lose anything either. Right? So to me, the only way to understand profit and loss symmetrically is in terms of sort of investment under uncertainty. Right? You lose money when you spend money. You earn losses when you spend money on inputs and combine them to produce outputs that nobody wants by the time you've produced them. That's how you have losses. But you can't have loss without investment. So then entrepreneurship can't be discovery because then there's no way to explain profits and losses. Symmetrically. And of course, again, I think, uh, you know, entrepreneurs have to, be, have to be owners. They have to own something. They have to put capital at risk. They have to have skin in the game to earn a profit, which means there's also the possibility of loss. Just as a little footnote on this, um, I had this interesting uh, conversation with Pete Bedke and some other people online about this point. Um, you know, Kirshner refers to what he calls the pure entrepreneur, and he, he cites Mises as giving a description of the pure entrepreneur by citing the following passage. This is page 254 of Human Action, the Scholar's Edition. Let us try to think the imaginary construction of a pure entrepreneur to its ultimate logical consequences. This entrepreneur does not own any capital. 
The capital required for his entrepreneurial activities is lent to him by the capitalists in the form of money loans. If he succeeds, the net profit is his. If he fails, the loss must fall on the capitalists, sorry, who have, H-A-V-E, who have lent him the funds. In other words, Mises does seem to talk about some sort of abstract notion of a, a moneyless entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who invests no capital, but just discovers sort of arbitrage opportunities and then reaps the profit. The problem is if you keep reading, the very next sentence of this passage is as follows. This is Mises, the very next sentence. Such an entrepreneur would, in fact, be an employee of the capitalists who speculates on their account and takes 100% share in the net profits without being, concerned, without being concerned about the losses. In other words, this so-called pure entrepreneur is actually not an entrepreneur at all, but just it's kind of like an agent working for the capitalists where the capitalists say, oh, hey, go out and find some ideas and bring them to me. And if I, if I like them, I'll invest in them and I'll pay you a finder's fee. But you're not really an entrepreneur. You're just an employee or, a, or a, a contractor who helps the investors, the owners, find good invest, uh, you know, places that they can invest their money. A capitalist is always also virtually an entrepreneur and speculator. Okay, so if you own productive assets under uncertainty, you are by necessity an entrepreneur because there's no guaranteed safe return for those investments. If you have any doubt whatsoever about what I'm trying to get at with this distinction, go watch the scene from Fargo, original movie Fargo, where Jerry goes to his rich father-in-law, Wade, and tries to get money for a deal. Some of you young people are looking at me blankly. This is not the Netflix series, but like the original movie, the Coen Brothers movie, uh, uh, that, that is sort of a cult classic. But just look for this scene on YouTube. Uh, the, the protagonist, Jerry, has gotten himself into some kind of a jam where he owes a bunch of money to people. He needs money. And that's why he arranges to have his wife kidnapped as sort of their uh, original plot device of the movie. Then things go sideways. But at one point in the movie, he, he has this idea for some kind of investment or some kind of a venture that's going to make him a lot of money, solve all his problems. So he goes to his wealthy father-in-law and tries to get money for the deal. And of course, the father-in-law wants to pay Jerry a finder's fee for bringing the deal to the father-in-law. And Jerry's saying, no, no, it's my deal. You give me the money, I make the investment. And of course, they laugh him off because you know, we're not, not going to give you money. We're not a bank, Jerry, if any of you remember the scene. But go watch it on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to see my debate with, with Bedke, the great Bedke-Klein debate of 2017, <laughs> this was on Liberty Matters, uh, it's a Liberty Matters uh, discussion on Kirchner. Actually, Mario Rizzo and Frederick Sauté were also involved in this debate, but forget about them. Um, you can see these issues sort of uh, discussed in greater detail. Of course, I think I won easily. Um, so to conclude, um, you know, it, it, there is, a, there is a, a, a vibrant research literature in entrepreneurship today that is not explicitly Austrian, but is very sympathetic to Austrian economic theory. Okay, so there are entrepreneurship periodicals and lots of books and, of course, courses and seminars and so forth. And, you know, this mainstream entrepreneurship research literature and practitioner literature uh, is very Austrian friendly. Okay, so those of you... Uh, students, scholars who are interested in uh, uh, finding new research topics, uh, you're interested in research projects that, that uh, you know, with, with which you can engage with uh, your fellow students and fellow professionals uh, in academia, I think entrepreneurship is an excellent field of inquiry. Right? So there are a lot of debates in that literature, outstanding issues about what entrepreneurship really means. How do we conceptualize the entrepreneur? Right. Are entrepreneurs just self-employed people like, like street vendors and small business owners? Are they innovators or is entrepreneurship something more fundamental as Mises uh, would hold? What's the relationship between you know, what entrepreneurs do and the skill with which particular entrepreneurs do it and the success of business firms, right? Firm growth, profitability, firm dynamics, uh, innovation, and so forth. What's the relationship between entrepreneurship as, and economic growth? What should be public policy toward entrepreneurship? 
Do we need special government programs to encourage entrepreneurs, to subsidize them, to, to train them, and so forth? You can sort of anticipate what my answer might be. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room for Austrian economists and people interested in Austrian economics to participate in these discussions and really to advance the modern entrepreneurship literature uh, in the right direction. Thanks very much. Thank you.